So that's just story number one. So next week, there's going to be another summer story. And so what I love about summer stories is, again, they're testimonies. And we can relate to some of the things that people are going to be sharing. We can relate to maybe some of the things that Danny went through growing up or in a split home or whatever the the thing may be. But we can also see what God can do. That when we give our lives to God and when we start to allow God to do, when we do things his way, things change. When we continue to do things our way, things can become a little bit more difficult. And so as we're, as we're in summer stories, we're going to be talking about consecration. Can you guys say consecration with me? Consecration. Uh, we just came back this week, my husband and I, from kids camp. And we got to take our two oldest, yeah, and there's some up here that went to kids camp, they're going like this. Uh, but we got to go, yes, we got to go to kids camp. And one of the things that I loved about kids camp is that kids are not taught consecration. They don't really know what that word means. And some of us Christians don't know what that word means either. But what I saw at kids camp is that they had a reverence for the presence of God when God's presence was in the room. That it was a natural instinct for them to know that it was time to worship, that it was time to posture our hearts for, to respect and to honor God. And so consecration, I believe, is something that we already have, but we haven't been taught how to activate it and how to use it. And if you said yes to Jesus today, or if you're a believer in Christ in this house, then this message is going to be a little bit challenging for you when I first um, start talking about it. And so like I said earlier during encounter time, Passion Church is not a church, it's church where we play church, where you come here and we just get to share what you want to hear and then you get to leave and you feel good inside. Yes, the presence of God can do that and it will continue to do that, but we also preach what's in the Bible. We also preach what's true. And sometimes what's true can sometimes come to our flesh. What is the flesh? The flesh is is the things that we desire to do that are apart from God. That's the flesh. And sometimes when we preach the truth, our flesh goes against our spirit and we're kind of like, uh, I don't really know if I like what that preacher is saying or I don't really know if that really fits me. Well, today we're going to talk about what the word of God says. And so we're going to pray real quick before we get started. So Holy Spirit, I pray for all ears to be open. I pray for all forms of pride to be released, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move and that you would speak to me and to everybody with what your word has to say, not what I have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So consecration. Consecration involves purification. In the Old Testament, it involved bathing, new clothing. It was anything that was unclean to God had had to become clean. And we see this in the book of Exodus, the second book in the Bible, where God is telling Moses specific instructions of what he needed to do. And in those instructions, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's Exodus chapter 40, if you want to take note, and you can read it at home. Exodus chapter 40, verses 9 through 15, I'm going to read you the first two verses. It says this, then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it, circle that if you have your Bible, and all its furniture so that it may become holy, underline become holy. You shall also anoint the altar of burnt offerings and all its utensils and consecrate, circle, the altar so that the altar may become most holy, underline. And it keeps going and going. It keeps saying consecrate this, anoint this so it can become holy. So the equation is anoint so, it can become, so you can consecrate, so it can become holy. So that's the Old Testament. So Pastor Brandy, how does it apply in the New Testament? What does anointing mean? Anointing is the Holy Spirit. When we see anointing oil, it symbolizes the Holy Spirit. So then in our context today, it would be Holy Spirit, teach me to consecrate myself so I can become holy. That's what that looks like. So Holy Spirit, talk to me. Tell me in what area I need to become clean and righteous so that I can be holy. 
And I believe that sometimes this is not taught enough in our churches. What we teach and what we preach is everybody come to Jesus and then go ahead and figure it out. Right? I don't know if you felt that way before. Maybe you came to Jesus and it was an exciting moment and God touched your heart because I believe that it happened here today. That some of you guys received Christ or you came back to Jesus and you felt something inside. Maybe some of you guys were weeping. There was an emotion that happened with, with your relationship with Christ. And then you're going to leave here. And now what are you going to do? But I believe that this has also happened to people who have been Christians for many years. We have forgotten the word consecration. We've almost even viewed this word consecration as something that is, something that is not capable or something that is, that's not something that I have to do because Jesus already did it for me. And so today we're going to go back. It's almost to the basics that after salvation... The next step after salvation is consecration. The next step after salvation is holiness. The reason why we come to Jesus and we need Jesus' blood is because we're unholy. We're unclean. And so his blood washes us, and after we're washed, we become clean. Okay, let's set the tone for that. But then how do we stay clean? How do we stay righteous? How do we stay in a place where we can be seen as holy before God? And that, that takes consecration. Consecration should be the next step when we acknowledge Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It happens when our spirit becomes alive and it starts to realize that there is unholiness in us. Have you been in a moment where you've said yes to Jesus, you started following him, maybe it's recent, maybe you've been following Christ for quite a long time, and you just start to feel a little different around the things that you really didn't care about. The things that you were doing, that it was just fun and games, and you know what, it didn't really bother you, but all of a sudden, you came to Christ, and you're kind of feeling like some tension, even though nobody's bringing tension around you. Maybe you're going to a place or to a family member's place, or maybe your language is starting to shift or you're starting to hear certain kinds of languages and you're like, oh, I don't really know if that sits well with me anymore. Maybe as Pastor Romeo was preaching about deceptive pride and we talked about homosexuality and we talked about abortion and we talked about all these things that God wants us to do that are morally, wants us to know what is moral, morally right, biblically, and you're kind of like, oh, man, like this is kind of making me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Guess what? That's what happens when our spirit and our flesh are going against each other. That's what happens when God is trying to show you, hey, there are some areas in your life that need to be consecrated, that need to be made clean and holy. Because if they're not, guess what happens? Pastor preached about humanism. There is this very fine line that when we, when we do not pursue consecration, Again, to become holy and to stay holy. When we don't pursue that, we start to slowly deviate into the line of humanism, which is all about us, how I feel, how somebody made me feel. Not what God said to me, but what somebody else said to me that offended me. That's what happens when we do not learn what consecration is. We can get some amen, that's okay. So consecration is understanding that our flesh, our sinful side, is weak. It's understanding that we are weak in nature in the sense of, so don't misquote my words, in the sense of we are sinful people. That when we are born, we are born sinful. We are born with the ability to, do the, to make the wrong choice, pretty much. We are born with that ability. But then Jesus Christ came died for us, his blood covers a multitude of sins. So then he washes us. It's a form of consecration of what he did. But we have to understand what the flesh is and what the flesh desires. Because if you don't understand what your flesh desires, then you're just gonna continue to go through the motions. And the last time I checked, when I said yes to Jesus, his blood was enough for me. When I said yes to Jesus, it's supposed to transform me. I'm supposed to be a different person. My thought patterns are supposed to change. That is what it means to say yes to Jesus. And I believe that there's some of us in this place today that that hasn't happened yet. That you've said yes to Jesus, that you've been walking, that you've been doing the, the talk, that you've been wearing the shirts, everything. 
but there hasn't been the transformational work of the Holy Spirit in your life. When I was 16 years old, 16, 17 years old, um, I had already experienced Jesus. I had experienced Jesus since I was eight years old. And when I was 13, I experienced the Holy Spirit. And I was already, God was transforming my life at a young age. But then 16, 17 came, and some of you guys have heard this, this part of my testimony. And I started to be in a same-sex relationship with a, with a uh, woman, a, a young girl. And in those moments, my spirit knew that it was wrong. My flesh desired to continue to do it. I wanted God, and I wanted all that God had for me, but my flesh, my, my other desire, wanted to continue to live this lifestyle. And so a few things would happen in that moment, and I'm sharing this story because there's some of you in this place, whether it's, whether it's same-sex attraction or any other thing that you can think of, that you are in this struggle of, I really, really want to do God's will, but I'm also over here and I really, really like this. Consecration says, sacrifice and obedience go over feeling. And so what happened was I had to learn that my flesh, and so in Galatians 5, 19 through 21 says this, the acts of the flesh are obvious. They're obvious. That means that you can't say you don't notice it. The acts of the flesh are obvious. And let me, let me just put this little context for you. The book of Galatians was written to believers. It was not written to people who didn't know Christ. So what I'm about to read is something that was written to fellow believers. And it says this, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So I just read you guys a whole list of things. And we can easily say, Pastor Randy, I'm good. I come to church. I don't really struggle with any of those. Maybe a little bit of jealousy. Maybe a little bit of selfish ambition. But sexual immorality, no. Idolatry, no, no way. Witchcraft, absolutely not. Hatred, I don't hate. Um, jealousy, um, fits of rage. Do you guys know what fits of rage is? It's like when you're driving and somebody's in front of you and they're going really, really slow and you're like, eh, eh, eh. that's a fits of rage sometimes, okay? It's when we kind of lose it, right? Or if your child says, yeah, my mommy lost it. That was probably a fit of rage, okay? My son's sitting in the front row, so he can probably testify of that. Envy, to desire, to grudge, to resent. We don't think about that. Are we resentful about something or someone? Because that's, that's part of the flesh. Dishonesty. Sexual immorality. Pastor Romeo did a phenomenal job discussing what happens when we allow pride to take center stage. It really does start with sexual immorality, and it's kind of funny that the first thing that was listed here was sexual immorality. And it said, sexual immorality can be adultery, it could be lust, it could be pornography, it could be sex outside of marriage, it could be anything that's not pleasing to God that's sexual. And we live, I don't know if you've been able to look around our world, our schools, but we live in a society now where actually sexual immorality is applauded. Those things are okay. That when we talk about it within the church, when we talk about sex before marriage, when we talk about um, porn or lust or adultery, it becomes this offense. But it's in here, and it's, it's not in here to shame. Absolutely not. It's in here to draw you closer to God, to allow you to see that if we do, do it the way that God wants us to do it, then there's benefit to that. And that there's also hope. That there's hope. 
that if we struggle in any of those areas, that we have Jesus as our intercessor before God to help us. Consecration kills the flesh to allow the spirit to thrive. And it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 15, and I'm going to read kind of like jumping around because it's a long, long text. But it says this, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live accord, accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. So what happens when our mind is governed by the flesh? death but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace do you want peace in your life then you have to be governed by the holy spirit govern means you're submissive and submissive again can have this oh that word submissive when i hear it it just makes me like oh i don't want to listen anymore no 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 submissiveness True biblical submissiveness is not that somebody is controlling you or devaluing you or stepping on you. True submissiveness to the Holy Spirit means that he takes care of us when we listen to his instructions. It's when we go outside of what he says that it feels like it's controlling. And then it continues to say this. I'm going to skip to verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you... He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh. It's to live, it's, it's to live according to it, to the spirit. So back to my story. So that happened when I was 15, 16, and I remember this tension because by this point, I had already felt the Holy Spirit. I had already tasted and seen that the Lord was good in my life. And I had committed my life to Christ. And there was this part of me, my flesh, the sexual impurity component, the unclean part of me. And we can, we can go as deep as to say there were some things in my childhood that kind of already gave me this reason to kind of go in that direction. But at the end of the day, the enemy doesn't care who you are, how you look, and where you live. He doesn't care how old you are. He doesn't care your social status. All he cares to do is to make sure that you're going to walk unclean and unrighteous. That's what he cares about. How he does it, it doesn't matter to him. It doesn't matter if it's things that happen in your childhood. It doesn't matter if it's a lie that you learned when you were younger. It doesn't matter if you came to church and you got offended. He'll use the offense to make you stray away from the word of God. So it doesn't matter. So if we know the strategy, if we know that the enemy came to kill and destroy, then we have to know what, what he's trying to kill and destroy. And how is he going to do that? He's going to do that by feeding your flesh, by giving you temptation. He's going to do that by saying, oh, jealousy? That's not a big deal. Lying? It's just a little white lie. That's not a big deal. He's going to say, selfish ambition? Well, you have to network. You just got to get where you got to go. He's going to come and these very, we had this conversation with my son. The enemy will not come and make things obvious for you to live in the flesh. He will make it very subtle. So subtle that you're going to start to justify why it's okay. Why you're the exception as to why you don't have to follow what the word of God says. Why you're the exception for sexual immorality. Why, why I'm the exception for idolatry and witchcraft. But God, I'm the exception just because my, this has just happened. I'm the exception. You're, you're going to be okay. You're going to understand why I'm still living this lifestyle. Absolutely not. There is no exception. I'm sorry to say that. There's only holy or unholy, righteous or unrighteous. There's no in between. And guess what? This is not to say, well, you, oh gosh, Pastor Brandy, I feel horrible. There should be some conviction that's happening right now. What's conviction is that place inside of you that's unholy that's saying, oh, like some of those things are me. So I was in the same-sex relationship for probably a good year. 
year and a half. And I remember coming to the altar during that year and a half and pleading, pleading with the Lord to change my mind, to change my heart, to change my desires. Without knowing I was doing a form of consecration, all I knew to do was to run to Jesus and to just tell him, this is where I'm at. It's wrong. But this is where I'm at, Jesus. And I need you because I know that your word says that you're the restorer, that you're powerful, that you can change hearts and desires. What I didn't know then, which is what I wish I knew now, which is what I'm about to share with you, is that consecration is not, wasn't a feeling. It's obedience and it's sacrifice. If I can have the keys play. And this is what I discovered in this moment of tension, in this moment of feeling Man, everything that I'm doing is wrong. I feel horrible to the point where suicidal thoughts happen, depression happen. All of, see, this is what happens when we live in the flesh. When we live in the flesh, it feels great in the moment. It feels great to justify that what I'm doing, God, because my dad left, God, and you placed this woman in front of me, it's okay. She's going to love me the way you love me. That was literally the thought process going through my 15, 16-year-old mind. It was a lie. Again, the enemy used one little thing. One thing. My dad at the time was in serving in Iraq. This is when September 11 happened. And there was a lot of things happening in my family. Those things... Feed your flesh when you don't know how to submit your flesh to the Lord. The weight of my sin, and this is where I feel like some of us have even lost feeling sin in our lives. We just walk around. <laughs> we just walk around like everything's great. We walk around like you're not serving a holy God. We walk around like the God that you serve is not righteous. We walk around like Jesus is just something that I can put on a shirt and it makes me righteous. We numb the feeling of conviction. We numb the feeling of holiness because it's more comfortable for me to sit on this side and not have to take accountability from my God. And because we have this view that God's going to come down and put his wrath upon us when all he wants is to make your relationship right with him. Because the benefits of consecration is that God gets to do amazing things through you. That's the benefit. And the enemy has skewed consecration, holiness, righteousness as something that is unattainable. That's unattainable. What does that mean? That you can't reach it. Pastor Brady, I can't. If you were just to know my situation, if you were just to know what's going on, there's no urgency for righteousness in your life then. There's no urgency. And if you're, the urgency is not there, it's because you have not understood that the God that you said yes to is holy. He's holy. So what happens? We get offended when we talk about the things that are unholy. We, we, we get hurt like, how can God not love me? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. They're in here. So I confess my sin. And it was the most... Uh, <laughs> Ugly scene ever. My poor mom. Um, Holy Spirit gave her guidance in that. I confessed my sin. And the feelings didn't go away. I still wanted to be in that relationship. I actually had thoughts of running away with um, this girl. Even though my heart wanted Jesus. I had not fed my flesh enough spirit. I haven't fed my spirit enough. So my flesh was overtaking me. I remember that I went through a two-year season, two years of consecration, of separation, of choosing Jesus over my fleshly desire, 
which is something that we are not taught to do. We are just taught to give in when it gets tough. We're just taught to say, okay, I can't, so I just have to be this way. No. The word of God talks about endurance and trials and that you will feel pain. Consecration breathes your anointing. Consecration gives you your anointing. When you consecrate yourself, the anointing that God has given for you specifically, the aroma that people get to smell that is of Jesus Christ comes through consecration. It comes through knowing that my desire, my fleshly desire to be with a woman, I had to come to an understanding and I had to decide I will kill my flesh with the word of God and I will feed my spirit so that my God can be glorified. That is what you do. All over this room, and I'm just sharing that story. It could be anything. It could just be that you have a bad attitude all the time. It could just be that everything's negative. It could be self-worth. Lack of confidence, anger, anything that makes us unholy before our God. And it says this at the end, Galatians 5.22, because it gets better. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. That means if you do all those things, you're good to go. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. You crucify the flesh. If I had a cross up here, it would look like me writing homosexuality and crucifying it. It would look like me putting lying and crucifying it to the cross. It would look like me putting um, debauchery, dishonesty, um, witchcraft. You're reading them horoscopes. Guess what? You open the door for the enemy. You're doing curandismo, limpias. If you speak Spanish in here, you know what I'm talking about. You crucify it to the cross. That's what it looks like to consecrate ourselves before a holy God who deserves all the glory and all of the praise. I'm tired of the enemy making you think that you coming to church today is enough Jesus. I'm tired of the enemy deceiving you and making you think that there is a plan B after you say yes to Jesus, that you can divorce Jesus as quickly as you say yes to him when you don't like what he says or because you haven't felt it. Yeah, we divorce him immediately when we don't feel it anymore. When it becomes hard, Jesus, peace out. This lifestyle wasn't meant for me. I'm tired of the enemy making you think that his blood, his precious blood, Shed was only for certain things. This thing doesn't go underneath the blood. First John verse one through seven says this, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin, all sin. Not just this category, not just this category or this one, all sin. His blood is still powerful. The enemy wants you to play church, to fall into the trap that Jesus is only to be worshiped on Sundays. That a Sunday service makes you righteous when righteousness comes with a cost. The cost of dying to yourself. This includes all that you have ever known. When I came to Jesus Christ and when I submitted my life to him, There was an environment that I grew up in in my family. 
Family first, right? Stick with family. Support family 100%. Under the kingship of my Jesus, I do what the Holy Spirit says. And if that is contrary to what my family wants me to do, I don't do it. My children, my husband and I are submitted to the Holy Spirit. And just because I want to please a family member, I will not unsubmit from the Holy Spirit. I will stay submitted. I'm tired of the enemy making you think that love is compromising his word and truth so that others don't get offended while you slowly denounce him for the approval of others instead of the approval that really matters. We are so consumed with the eyes of others that we forget what is pleasing and sacrificing to God. I'm tired of the enemy making you think that time is a commodity, that you have until next week to say yes to Jesus. You don't know that. You don't know that. That maybe you'll talk to your family member during Christmas time because we have all the time in the world. We don't. That's a lie from the enemy. That other people will represent the gospel because it's not your responsibility to do it. That's a lie. I'm tired of the enemy making you believe that righteousness can no longer be obtained so you compromise with sin. I'm tired of Christians playing church and falling for the trap of the enemy. We don't have time to play church anymore. To be offended because our flesh can't take the word of God because all it's used to is feel good inspirational words. At the first hint of offense, we crumble and we run the opposite direction. We are not used to allowing the fire of God to refine us. We're not used to it. A little bit of fire gets on you, you're out the door. We have been feeding our flesh more with self-pity, fleshly preference, people-pleasing, pleasure, non-biblical knowledge that it no longer knows how to receive truth from the Spirit of God. Consecration is what my people need to learn to do, says the Lord. They need to learn to come to me in reverence and in honor. Joshua 3, 5 And we're going to end with this so you can stand with me. Joshua 3, 5 says this. And I love the book of Joshua because if you read further in Joshua, they make a a statement that says that Joshua died. And it says that the next generation did not know the Lord. A whole generation went without knowing who God was. We could be on the verge of that happening because we choose not to consecrate ourselves. Because when we consecrate ourselves, we live differently. We're not common. People notice the difference. Actually, more eyes become on you because now you're not part of the crowd. You're outside the crowd. Joshua 3, 5 says this, Joshua told the people, So Joshua came, he had his army, they were supposed to go do something. But the Lord told Joshua, before you even start anything, you must do this. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. So the lie that consecration reduces something or gives you rules or you got to follow this and that. No, there is a benefit. God wants to do amazing things among you and it requires consecration. It requires the understanding of holiness. And maybe what I said today kind of hit a little bit hard and you're like, man, why do I feel this way? I feel a little bit of anger. Take that up to, with the Holy Spirit. If there is unholiness in you, he's not shaming that. He's just saying, make it right. Just make it right. Repent before the Lord. Repentance means just, God, I'm sorry. 
No. I'm sorry. Holy Spirit, help me. So I'm just going to pray over you guys. Holy Spirit, I thank you for this word, God. I thank you that you want us to consecrate ourselves before you, that you want us to be holy and seek righteousness, God. I pray for every person under the sound of my voice, God, and online. God, I pray that whatever the enemy is even saying right now, God, for them to just feel offended, God, or to feel like it's too much to even follow you, God. Lord, that is a lie from the pit of hell, God. We pray right now the blood of Jesus over your people, God. I pray for revelation, Holy Spirit, that as they go home, that they would know, Lord, that they would seek your face, God, that they would start to learn what it looks like to be holy and righteous, God, that they would have an urgency, God, to please you. We thank you for what you're doing, God. We thank you that revival is here, but revival requires consecration. So God, if if you are ready, if you are ready for God to do, to to learn how to be consecrated, I need you to lift your hands all across the room if that is you. If you're not ready, that's okay. Repeat after me, Holy Spirit, teach me to seek righteousness. Teach me consecration. Show me what's unholy and teach me to make it holy. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna read our benediction. If you brought your tithes and offering, please go ahead and drop those off at the end of service or there'll be a QR code after this. Next Sunday, we're highlighting kingdom builders and youth camp, so you don't want to miss that. So let's read together. One, two, three. It's all about kingdom pursuit, forsaking everything for the king. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You are dismissed. If you said yes to Jesus today, fill out that card. Go to our foyer. We have a Bible for you, and we want to connect with you.